is John Cola with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. And uh, I just got a new toy in the mail. It's right here. Check it out. This is actually called the uh, Garden Tower Project. And this is known as a Garden Tower. And what it is, it's basically, it looks like a 55 gallon drum with uh, heavy modifications to grow food in. But why I like this so much is because this has 45 planting spots all up and down through this whole barrel. In addition, you can plant some plants up the top. So you can plant over 50 plants in just four square feet of space. So, you know, literally, that's a lot of plants for just a small area. So this is especially good if you have a patio, a deck, or, you know, you live in an apartment or condo and you don't have a lot of space. Maybe you just have a little space on your patio outside and you could grow a lot of food in this guy. I have seen other, you know, uh, tower gardens which I don't particularly care for, but this guy lets you grow a lot more and it lets you grow it in soil. Plus, this is very intelligently designed. It's probably the best vertical tower garden system I've ever seen. Let me go ahead and explain why. Besides the 45 planting holes, what's unique about this system is it's got this center tube here in the middle. And what they do in the center tube is you're gonna uh, put food scraps and red wiggler worms or composting worms the worm is going to eat the food scraps, break it down, spread the worm compost or vermicompost all throughout the unit to help fertilize the plants in there. Plus, on the bottom of this unit, there's a place where you can actually uh, take out the food scraps out of the bottom. So that's really cool. This vertical tower garden makes its own fertilizer. You can't say that for other ones. Another thing is that this is water conserving. So, you know, water is a very precious resource, especially depending on where you live in this day and age. And this one conserves water. How does it do that? Well, very simply, you'll pour the water on or water up at the top. All the plants will get water, you know, the water will drain down. All the different plants planted in all these little pocket things are going to get water. Then the water goes to the bottom. Once it gets to the bottom, it's basically funneled out certain holes and you're going to put a little bucket underneath and all the water that goes through now you can have it in a bucket. You can reuse this water to water it again so that there's minimal water loss. Many just standard garden pots or whatever, you know, you'll water and then it just goes on the deck or down below and actually the, the excess water on your deck could actually ruin your deck or if you live like on a three story apartment building, you're on the third story and you have to water your plants. When you overwater, man, the stuff will drip down to your neighbor, which isn't cool either. This, you could collect the water and reuse it. So this is, a, I mean, this is a very well thought out design. So happy to be setting one up and sharing this with you guys to show you guys how it works and how I'm going to specifically set it up. So this just came to me. As you guys can see, there's a U.S. post office uh, <laughs> label on there. And I mean, it literally came shipped like this. So I was amazed it actually sh shipped like this, like through the mail, without even any wrapping. It was not damaged or anything. I mean, it looks totally perfectly fine. So in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to actually set this guy up to show you guys how easy it is to set up. I'm going to make a specific potting mixture, potting soil mixture to put in here and I'm going to show you guys that as well. Plus you'll see me plant out my plants and by the end of this video you'll see how easy it is to set one of these garden tower projects up if you want to grow vertically at home. So I guess with that, let's get in to uh, unboxing and assembly. So let's see what we got in the box here. Sounds like some hardware. So construction on this, super simple, super easy. I think pretty much all we're gonna need to do is really bolt on a few legs and uh, put a couple plugs in there. All right, so in the box here, it looks like we, you get some instructions. It's definitely important to follow the instructions. I might read them or look at them, but I'm just gonna kinda do my own thing. Looks pretty basic. Um, oh, and next we got some this is really nice. Stainless steel hardware. You know, I mean, if you just use standard hardware or something like this that's outdoors, it's going to rust. Not cool. I like that they're providing heavy duty stainless steel hardware. In addition, we have the wood legs. So this stands it up off the ground so that you can put a bucket underneath and collect all the water. Plus, it also allows you to garden whether you're sitting or standing. So if you're in a wheelchair, you can still garden in this. Uh, garden tower project so definitely really cool there's three legs and it looked to be a nice uh, nice uh, hardwood here in addition we have two more parts just the standard top uh, this looks like it's made out of the uh, PVC and the top basically goes on here 
and it doesn't sit all the way down. It kind of like sits just on top so that it doesn't go all the way down because in the end you wouldn't be able to get it off. Plus this top has some holes in it for aeration. And you want to learn more about this at uh, GardenTowerProject.com. Finally, we have this big, big thing here. This is some kind of compression plug thing. And uh, what this does is this actually goes underneath the uh, bottom of the uh, whole unit here. You guys can look at that. Hello, you can see me in the tube. What's up, dude? <laughs> All right, so the plug actually uh, fits in the bottom of this tube here. And this is a, uh, you can remove this plug for uh, harvesting your worm castings from underneath. So, I mean, this is definitely really uh, well thought out. I like it a lot for sure. So next, let's get in to the actual assembly. It's going to be a breeze. So for the assembly, we're going to need a few things. We're going to need a little small, like, table or something else I like. And what I have today is a seven-gallon bucket. What we're going to do is we're going to simply take this guy and put it on top of the bucket to get it off the ground. And that'll just hold us for now. Uh, other things we'll need are, of course, some uh, tools. So we got some half-inch uh, ratchet and a half-inch uh, driver there. And that's just going to uh, basically bolt on these legs. Now these legs have special cutouts and they are labeled. This one's labeled C. You're going to look for the C on the little uh, unit itself. And it's just going to kind of sit like that and you're going to kind of bolt them in. So uh, that's what I'm going to do next. All right, that's it. Two down, one more to go. Now the thing is you don't want to over tighten these. Don't be like, I'm a man, man, I can tighten it down hella hard. Maybe, you know, just finger tight and then like a couple more turns. So it'll be nice and uh, taut when you're all done. All right. It's got that last one cinched up. We're going to go ahead and take this off our bucket here. It's actually fairly light. Nice unit. Stands a good height off the ground. Next thing, we're going to go ahead and take our little plug here. And what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and unscrew this guy. And then when you unscrew it, it's going to loosen the tension on this little rubber bushing thing in here. And then you'll be able to take it and uh, put it underneath, shove it in the hole. And then you're going to go ahead and uh, screw it tight and it locks in place. So once you have your garden tower fully assembled, and it was actually quite a breeze to assemble, uh, you're going to want to do a few things. Number one, you're going to want to find the right location to place your garden tower. I recommend placing it in the sunniest location possible, the location that gets the most sun. After all, the more sun that your plant receives, the faster it's going to grow for you. But don't worry, even if you have a place that is a little bit shaded or you know doesn't get direct sun, that's all right because you could still grow some things. In a you know, shaded spot, it's definitely better to grow things like herbs and leafy greens, which will do okay, maybe but not you know excellent, meaning it'll still grow and make food for you, but just won't grow and yield as fast or as big. So uh, you want to select the right location and set it there before filling it up because if you fill it and then try to move it, it's going to be quite heavy. Uh, besides the location, you want to get something that's nice and level and if your location is like on grass or on um, you know dirt, you may want to put it on some metal blocks or bricks uh, to keep it off the, the wet ground. So after you have selected your location, the most important thing you need to do to be successful with your garden tower besides a nice sunny location is to fill it with the proper and appropriate soil mix. I cannot emphasize enough how important this is. If you just use dirt out of your you know yard and just fill it up with any old thing you know your plants may not do as well. Plus because this is a container garden you need to have proper aeration and proper moisture holding capabilities in there. So for that reason, I recommend using a potting soil mix. There are many potting soil mixes out in the marketplace and some are definitely better than others. I mean, usually in potting soils, but not always, you get what you pay for. If you pay you know, a good amount for a potting soil mix, you're gonna get high quality stuff. If the potting soil mix is pretty cheap, well then normally the ingredients aren't so good. You wanna get a nice fine potting soil that's gonna wanna contain things like coconut core, also some perlite in there plus also some compost and you know if you buy a pre bag one that's great because that's going to make it easy for beginners I like to personally make my own blend and that's what I'm going to show you now to how to make your own blend of a good potting soil that's going to work excellent in the garden tower that I'm assembling behind me 
So what I want to do is I want to have a nice fluffy mixture. If you just get dirt, whether it's sand or you know uh, mud or clay, it's going to fill up in there and the roots aren't going to have spaces to really grow optimally. You know, the, the plant roots don't grow through the soil, they grow between the airspace in the soil. So that's why a good fluffy mix is going to be optimal for this. And that's what most potting uh, mixes provide. So that's what I'm pretty much going to duplicate, kind of doing my own thing. And I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit. So most potting mixes, as I mentioned earlier, will contain like perlite, uh, coconut core, um, or peat moss plus some compost and other ingredients. And I'm gonna make up a mix myself instead of getting the perlite separate from the peat moss or coconut core. I've got some products here that have already done that for me. Many of you guys might know this stuff right here. It's actually called the Pro Mix BX with Mycorrhiza. This is basically the uh, perlite with the peat moss. And uh, it's from Canada, pre-made. It also has the beneficial fungi, the mycorrhizae, which is going to really supercharge your plant growth, help plants get more nutrition out of the soil that you're planting it in. So while you could use something like this, I found a much better alternative to using something as the Pro Mix as my base to my potting soil that I'm going to create in the wheelbarrow behind me. This guy, this is actually called the Air Max. So instead of just having the perlite and the peat moss, which I'm not a super huge fan of, and I, I still use it absolutely, and it's still a great medium. I prefer coconut core as a much better medium. Coconut core is more sustainable than the peat moss, and it's uh, more renewable. I mean, a coconut palm will produce over 100 nuts a year, and we'll eat the food and drink the water out of that, and that's some of my favorite foods. But also, you're left with the husk on the outside that can be actually put into a product like this to reuse this pretty much never ending resource as long as there's coconut trees abound. So I like the Air Max because it actually has the uh, the quadruple wash coconut fiber or core and this is very important that you get a high quality coconut core. Many coconut cores can be of low quality and things will not grow in them or grow that well, not be properly balanced. The coconut core is a great product but it needs to be washed to get all the different um, nutrients out of it that may have been sitting there from being in brackish water and whatnot. So I like this it has triple washed coconut core. In addition it also has the perlite, definitely really good. Also it has a paramagnetic rock and um, it's kind of like a rock dust and definitely really good. It also has a mycorrhiza and humic acid and seaweed. So these are some of my favorite products that I won't have to add myself into the mixture because it's already in the bag. So uh, what we're going to do next, actually, I'm going to probably uh, put in two of these bags. It's 1.5 cubic feet each, and uh, that's going to be about a total of three cubic feet. So then I think this thing holds, the garden tower holds maybe like uh, eight cubic feet or so. So that's going to be three. So that's going to be a good portion of it. The other things we're going to add in there in a fairly large proportion are things like the compost, uh, worm castings, and besides just the regular compost, we're going to add actually a fungal-based compost and just a few other things like the rock dust and some other things that I like and we're going to show you guys how to mix it up uh, behind me. Now we're going to make up the soil mix and uh, this is my favorite part actually because I really get to get my hands dirty. And we've got the wheelbarrow here, it holds about four and a half cubic feet of uh, soil. So what we're going to do is we're going to mix it in here, basically make two batches to fill the garden tower there. And the first ingredient we're going to use, like you just saw, is my base. We're going to use this stuff right here. It's actually called the Air Max. Once again, I just went over this stuff. I like it a lot. We're just going to go ahead and cut open the bag here. And definitely nice stuff. I mean, this stuff, you guys can see it. It's nice, rich, and black stuff. Really looks cool. Lots of perlite. And the coconut core in there, basically no smell to it. So I like that a lot. I'm going to go ahead and dump this in as our base ingredient. Now, if you can't get the Air Max or you can't find it, um, you're going to want to use something like a you know, good wash, coconut core, and a perlite to make up for it. Plus, you know, I'd also use the mycorrhiza, the, the kelp, and the seaweed, and the paramagnetic rock, and the other stuff that they're in here. But I like that they put it together for and they formulated an excellent blend that they've done a lot of testing on to get excellent growing results, if you know what I mean. So, I'm not going to go around and you know, reinvent the wheel when I could find a product that's going to really kick some butt. Let's go ahead and dump this guy out. And that's the base of what I'm using. So this stuff's nice and rich. 
And uh, what we want to do next is I want to show you guys and compare like the difference between this stuff here and uh, standard potting soil that you might buy. I mean, here's a standard potting soil, and it's made by Kellogg's. So we're going to go ahead and open this stu stuff up. So what we're going to do is we're going to probably put maybe, I don't know, a quarter of the bag in here to kind of get some more volume and mass to our mixture. You know, it's also kind of fluffy because this is a standard potting mix, but I also want to be able to share this with you guys and compare this stuff to the stuff I put in. It'll also give you some ideas on what normally is put in potting soil mixes, what you might want to look for and what you might not want to look for. So uh, let's pick up this bag here. I'm going to read you guys ingredients in here. It says uh, ingredients, composted forest products, composted rice hulls, composted poultry manure, perlite, kelp meal, worm castings, and iron sulfate. And this is an organic potting mix. I always recommend you guys, uh, whenever possible, purchase organic potting mixes without added uh, chemically derived factory made fertilizers from natural gas or petroleum products. So if it says organic, usually it's from natural and organic materials that I would actually use in my garden. Actually this one's actually uh, OMRI certified so that's definitely a good certification to look for if you can't find it in your area. But let's go ahead and pour out some of this stuff here. And once again this actually stuff is a uh, nice and black. We'll put in about that much right there. And uh, unlike the stuff that you just saw before, this stuff's actually nice and black. I don't know if you guys could see that on the camera. That's the stuff right here. And then if we uh, dig up some of the Air Max, look at the, look, look at the difference of the Air Max. Hopefully you guys can see the difference. This stuff, to me, looks like it has a lot of, like, you know, uh, uncomposted forest products. I'm not a super huge fan of uncomposted forest products, you know, which includes pieces of little wood chips and bark and stuff like this. I mean, I, this would not be my first choice for a potting soil to fill up my garden tower and that's why I'm just mixing this, some of it in. I mean some of it's good, got some rice hulls and some good you know a little bit of composted manure in there but I'm not that not a fan of that stuff either. So besides this stuff that we're gonna mix in we're gonna go ahead and actually put one of my favorite ingredients compost that I made myself. So I always recommend you guys make your own compost. If you can't make your own compost buy it from a reputable local source. A lot of the bag compost products in the stores are maybe not of high quality and are from things for you know that I wouldn't necessarily use so a lot of compost you may buy may be derived like entirely or mostly from animal manures which are from the factory feedlots which I wouldn't use. The compost that I made here is basically made out of a couple things food scraps and yard clippings number one number two uh, basically pine pellets or sawdust and also some coconut core that I've added in in addition so uh, let's get that stuff out all right so here it is I've sifted it all um, out of my composter sieved it through a half inch uh, sieve and this is my nice compost right here and this is some really rich stuff we're gonna add a five gallon bucket of it now this is definitely a uh, heavier soil or you know mix to add and that's why I'm glad I added all that perlite and coconut core in the Air Max product because we're just gonna mix this all together wow it has a nice neutral smell I like it a lot nothing better than your own homemade compost really cool so uh, the next thing we're gonna add to our mixture is something that I'm a big fan of and it's the rock dust not only do I just have one variety but I have like four different varieties of rock dust so we're gonna bring them up one at a time and I'm probably just gonna put like a scoop of each one you might be thinking, John, which rock dust is the best to have if you can only have one? Well, I recommend any rock dust that you could get affordably is definitely a good one to add. The Azomite's a good standard standby, but I have other brands that I've been experimenting with. And, you know, it's best to combine all the different rock dust into your mixture to assure your plants are going to get all the different minerals and trace minerals they need to function optimally. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to grab them one by one, put them in, maybe talk a little bit about each one, and... Uh, Keep this mixture rolling. So now I have the azomites, and actually I have both varieties, the uh, granular version and the micronized version or powdered up version. If you could only find azomite in the powdered version, that's the kind I'd recommend. Uh, the granular version is also cool. I've tried to do dissolve it and stuff and it doesn't dissolve quite as easily, but it's what's available in the local area because azomite can be hard to find. Uh, if you are looking for azomite and unable to find it in a local nursery, don't be alarmed, you can actually order it online. I have a video entitled Lowest Price Delivered on Rock Dust that you want to check my past videos for. Actually, that's where I got the stuff, the powdered stuff right here. So I'm just going to use a standard little cup here and we're going to take a, a cup of each of the different rock dust and pour it in my mixture. Uh, be aware when uh, dealing with the powdered up rock dust, uh, it is actually uh, 
a fine particulate, so you may want to use a dust mask or minimally be very careful when uh, dealing with it. So we got a little cup full here and I'm going to just carefully pour it into my mixture and we're going to go ahead and uh, continue adding stuff. Uh, next we're going to go ahead and add a whole bunch of the granular and I do have a video comparing the granular to the micronized version if you're interested but this stuff is actually a lot larger so we're just going to go once again uh, put this on our mixture as well. So next we have yet another rock dust It's actually called the Volcanic Minerals Plus or Spanish River Carbonate and uh, we're going to go ahead and once again put our scoop in here. Now this stuff is not quite as fine as the powdered up azomite so it's not quite as dusty and uh, we got a nice scoop there. This stuff's more of a sandy type texture, still a little bit dusty. You know, once again, my favorite thing to do is blend all different kinds of rock dust. If you can only find one, use one. If you can find many kinds, then use smaller amounts of each kind to get that synergistic effect to ensure your plants are going to have the minerals they need to succeed. So the Spanish River Carbonite may be available if you live up in Canada, on the East Coast, or even the East Coast of the U.S. That's where it's mined up in Ontario. So I like this one a lot. It's a good, well-balanced uh, rock dust that I found, and I'm happy to be able to include it in my garden. Uh, let's go ahead and get another rock dust next. The next rock dust we have is actually called the Gaia Green Glacier Rock Dust and this is from actually uh, British Columbia area of Canada. So if you're on the west coast of Canada, you may be able to find the Gaia Green Glacier Rock Dust. Uh, this is one of the oldest rock dust that I've been using for the longest time. This is actually a nice micronized version, probably about as fine as the, uh, as the azomite. And once again, we're just going to go ahead and get a nice uh, scooper here full and uh, dub this carefully. Now this one's quite powdered up so you want to just uh, you know uh, wear a respirator and try not to make it dust off too much. Next we have yet another trace mineral product. I mean this is how serious I am about rock dust. I just don't use one. I use many kinds to make sure my plants are going to be happy. It's like if you go to a buffet. Would you rather go to a buffet that just had a salad bar? Or would you rather go to the buffet that had the salad bar, the pizza station, the spaghetti station, the hamburger station, the taco station, the enchilada station? Right, well you get my point. <laughs> Your plants want all these different stations <laughs> and I'm providing it to them by giving a little bit of all these different kind of rock dust and I'm glad I'm able to do this. Actually this one's thanks to a viewer. This one's actually called the uh, Cascade Minerals. It's actually from the Pacific Northwest and we're going to go ahead and grab a scooper of this stuff. Nice big scoop. And this is actually kind of like a dark black kind of rock dust. It's uh, not quite as fine as the other ones. Maybe. Uh, a little bit more coarse than the Spanish River Carbonite. Uh, but it looks good nonetheless. I'm glad I'm adding this to my mixture as well. Next we have another trace mineral product. It's actually called the AgroWin Mineral Fertilizer. So yet another trace mineral supplementation. I heard this one comes actually from Europe, but the company is actually uh, distributing it out of the California. This is a nice like red color. I mean, it'd be cool to show these colors on the camera there all the different colors of the different rock dust. I mean different colors means different nutrients are in there. So uh, let's go ahead and go for the next one. So next mineral product we have is actually called the John and Bob's Maximize. So not only does this contain the minerals, it also contains beneficial microbes. It's going to help uh, basically break down the minerals and allow your plants to absorb them. So I like this guy a lot. We're going to go once again go ahead and put in a whole scoop full of John and Bob's Maximize in our mixture. I mean, all the different colors in these products are simply amazing. So another way to add minerals back into your soil is by using something called humic acids. And uh, this is some soil humates right here in this bag. I get them in bulk at the local feed store. And there's like these little black little pebble things. This has minerals that will be added back in the soil. Some of this is actually a powder. You can see kind of some of it blowing off. And I think this is definitely a good thing to add as well. Another thing I've talked about on my show in the past has been zeolite. And another thing I like to add to my soil mix is a zeolite. So we have some actually uh, powdered up zeolite in here. Once again, zeolite's just another mineral. J-A-M, just another mineral. And that's what I'm big on, adding minerals. I mean, think about it. Most people add NPK, which are three minerals, back in their soil. I'm adding a host of over 70 different minerals and all these different basically ground up rocks. The zeolite is actually a really fine particulate, so you want to, once again, wear a respirator for some of these things and try not to make it dust up so much. Alright, next we have yet another mineral, and this mineral is mostly carbon. I'm using the Soil Reef Biochar 
one of these days I'll have a specific video on the biochar for you guys and hopefully being able to get you guys a special price on some biochar because stuff can be very hard to find and actually quite expensive. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and put a scoop of this stuff. Now the bio, this is pre-inoculated biochar and if you're using biochar it's basically carbon. The carbon can suck nutrients out of your soil. That's why I like a pre-inoculated biochar like we have here with the soil reef. We're going to add uh, two scoops of this biochar into my mixture here. Now the biochar is good because it actually uh, gives the microbes a place to hide. Uh, think, you think of biochar kind of like you could think of a sponge with all little nooks and crannies. Well that's how it is looked under a microscope. And all the little microorganisms, beneficial ba bacteria and whatnot could hide in there and it gives them a nice home. Plus it adds carbon to the soil which is really important for the plant's growth. Uh, there's this soil called terra preta soil uh, from South America that's like nice dark rich soil and they found that it contained a large percentage of biochar so I think it's only a good thing to add to your garden and I'm adding it into my plant and mix. Next we're going to add another product from John and Bob's actually called Soil Optimizer. I started using it this year and uh, getting some amazing results in my garden by just simply adding some of the John and Bob's products. We're just going to go ahead and add uh, I don't know, not even that much. You don't even need enough that much of this stuff, like a half cup full. This product is mostly, once again, the humic acids. These are very important for the optimal soil fertility, especially, you know, when it relates to the bacteria and the microbes. And once again, that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to build the best soil and inoculate it with healthy soil microbes because it's the soil microbes that break down all the nutrients in the soil to actually feed your plants so they could dance. So just to ensure my plants get off to a good start, I'm gonna also add a natural plant-based organic fertilizer, not from manures, and it's right here. It's actually called the Nourish Biosol. This is a 721, and once again, we're just gonna go ahead and take a scoop of this stuff and uh, put it into the mix. So the next thing we're gonna add, I'm really hip on, it's the earthworm castings. Earthworm castings are probably one of the best things you could add back into the soil to increase the biodiversity of the beneficial bacteria and fungi that you could probably obtain locally, if not make yourself at home in a worm bin. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take like, I don't know, five scoops of this uh, worm castings. And these are the AgroWin worm castings. These are nice. This is nice, dark, rich, and black castings here. You know, and if I was able, I'd actually uh, use different kinds of castings because the quality of the casting is dependent on the feedstock of the worms. And I don't know exactly what the feedstock uh, they use for these castings, but once again, I like to use worm castings from different suppliers that are feeding their worms different things because the nutrients in the worm castings are going to be a little bit different. So I put a bunch, maybe I put more than my amount, but you know, it's, you can't overdo the worm castings. It will not burn your plants. So I added the worm castings. Next, let's add yet another kind of casting besides this, the worm castings. So the next thing we're going to add is we're going to add some insect frass. This is actually a 222 fertilizer. This is organic certified. And what this is going to do is not only add some nutrition, but more importantly, much like the uh, standard earthworm castings we added, it's going to add some beneficial microbes, so beneficial fungi and bacteria back in the soil which are actually going to help convert nutrition out of the soil and take it into the plants. Plus the insect frass is high in the chitin uh, which will help your plants uh, build their own defenses against insects. So we're just going to go ahead and uh, dump some of this bag out into our mixture. So the next ingredient that's also in my opinion very important to add which is what many gardeners may be leaving out and many potting soils probably don't have in this day and age is this product right here. This is actually called a boogie humus and what this is, this is basically wood chip compost made at a low temperature. So it's taken years and years for this compost or this humus to develop from basically rotten trees and wood chips and whatnot. And this is a fungal dominated compost. The compost I added earlier was a thermophilic compost that I made in my compost bins made with high heat. So this adds the bacteria. So this kind of compost basically harbors the fungi to get the fungi into my soil. And so that's why I'm adding the boogie hummus here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to simply add probably like half the bag into my mixture here. And this is some nice rich black stuff. Now many of you guys may or may not know but 
soils in the forest are actually fungal dominated where soils in the meadows and where vegetables would grow are bacterial dominated. That being said, it's not either or, it's not fungus or, you know, or fungi or bacterial dominated. It's always a mixture. So one of the things that's very important to me is to have a right mixture. As you can see, I'm putting very little fungal dominated compost, but a lot of bacterial based compost. So uh, that's why I do that, to have a, a good mixture so I get excellent growing results. So next, after we've added all the different ingredients to our potting soil mix, we're just going to simply mix it up. And I like to just use my hands to do that. I find it's a much better tool than a shovel because you could just literally just uh, pick up the soil and get your hands dirty and uh, mix this stuff up. So I just got all my potting soil blend mixed up and it's still definitely nice and fluffy, the uh, perlite and the coconut core from the Air Max uh, mixture worked very well, added uh, amounts of the other stuff as well. And I know some of you guys might be thinking, John, what's the ratios you use? Well, you know, I just kind of go by Gardner's intuition. You guys got some approximate values of what I use, like a scoop of this, a couple scoops of that, bag of this, bag of that, you know, bucket of this. And it's like in gardening and many things in life, I don't want to just give you guys a recipe. I want to give you guys the concept so you guys know the concept. is like you want to get a nice aerated soil mixture if you're making it yourself if you don't feel comfortable making a mixture like this yourself that's all right go buy a good high quality potting soil blend and put it in your uh, garden tower and i'm sure it's going to work fine for you i just want to dial it in to get the best and most explosive growth and highest quality produce i could grow so that's why i add a lot of these things i know some of these things may be hard to find expensive yada 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 you know, my base recipe, if you can't get all these ingredients that I use because you may or may not be able to, you want to definitely use a coconut core and a perlite. You also want to definitely use a compost, a thermophilic compost or a heat-based compost, plus also the fungal-dominated compost, plus you also want to use the rock dust and the worm castings. That's my bare minimum. If you want to go to town and add some of the extra stuff, more power to you. That's what I'm doing here and I thought I'd show that. So the next step is to simply put this mixture into my garden tower and start planting it out. All right, so after I got that soil mix made up, I've been actually just using a little three gallon bucket and uh, pouring it into the garden tower here, a little bit at a time. And my plan is I fill up the garden tower up to a certain level, and then I plant all the plants in it. This way I don't need to dig a hole for the plants because I fill up below the line. And then uh, plant the plants, and then go up to the next level and continue filling. I pretty much ran out of the uh, potting soil that I mixed and I'm probably almost about a halfway full in the barrel so I'm gonna have to fill up another uh, wheelbarrow full and do my specialized mix once again. And before I do that I want to talk about the plant starts that I'm planting. So whenever planting in your garden tower or even in raised beds or containers you want to plant the appropriate plants. We are here in the fall getting into the winter so I'm going to plant plants that are going to be able to deal with the weather that we're going to be getting here, you know, some colder nights and whatnot. So, you know, planting things like tomatoes and zucchinis and cucumbers and peppers, probably not a good idea unless you live somewhere in Hawaii or something uh, where it's nice weather year round. You know, certain plants can't deal with colder weather. So the plants such as the brassica family plants, the broccoli, cauliflower, kale, collard greens, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi they're going to do just great in the cold weather as will the lettuce to a much lesser extent uh, the lettuce can handle some cold weather but not an ex as extreme cold as the cruciferous plants can but uh, in this container above the ground it should stay a little bit warmer uh, than actually in the dirt plus this guy's probably going to go inside a greenhouse that i'm soon to construct uh, this winter so that it'll keep a little bit warmer and i'll be getting some good growth and uh, having harvests of lettuce all winter long. I guess the next thing is we're going to go ahead and um, uh, plant another layer in here and then make another soil blend. Another thing I've noticed is that because the spacing on these holes um, are not too large I find best that the standard small six packs uh, work best to transplant from. These are actually kind of small cell six packs and you could put those guys in there fairly good. I was planting these uh, jumbo sixers here. These jumbo sixers actually have a lot large larger space and uh, these are probably approaching like a three inch or two inch uh, diameter here and so uh, we I have to squeeze those and fit them in but yet they would fit very nicely uh, if you are trying to transplant from four inches 
might be a bit of a challenge to uh, get into the garden tower here. So I'd recommend transplanting from six packs or of course you can also start from seeds. I always recommend especially inexperienced gardeners uh, start from the transplants. You're guaranteed a much higher level of success. I guess the uh, next step we're going to go ahead and uh, plant some more stuff in. Let me go ahead and show you guys how I do that. Alright so I'm continuing to plant out my garden tower here and I found a few approaches that works fairly well. Now the average person might just take the soil, okay I got all the soil and I'm just going to dump it all in there and then if you do that then you're going to have to just basically dig out little holes to get your transplants in if you're transplanting. Furthermore plants that are in nice large like 3 inch, 4 inch pots won't necessarily fit in here. I mentioned earlier that uh, you know the smaller uh, 6 pack size are easy to transplant because they'll go in from the outside but if you have larger pots like, you know, like a three and a half inch, four inch pot like this, you can't really compress it down and get it in there. It's not going to really work so well. So what I'm going to share with you now is actually uh, uh, my favorite way to actually uh, plant in here for plants that are a little bit larger than the hole right here. You're going to plant it from the back side. So let's go ahead and give you a cool camera angle on that. All right, so what we have here, we have some uh, jumbo six packs that we're trying to plant in here. And these guys are actually rather large. So uh, we can't just, uh, you know, shove these in the front side. So what we're going to do is we're just going to basically uh, pull one of these guys out here. And very carefully, we're going to take this guy and go over to the planting hole, which is right here. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to dig out this a little bit. Dig it out and dig it down. We're going to carefully support the plant so that when we put it underneath and uh, lift it through, we're not really going to damage it too much. And then we're just going to kind of put it in place all the way up to the top. And then we're just going to go ahead and uh, take and brush some soil underneath it to pack it in there. Uh, next, I'll repeat this for all nine holes in the same level. And then we'll basically uh, dump soil on the top to raise it up to the next level. Actually, this is my second to the last level I'm planting out. Hey, what's up? I'm right here. Whoa, this is a bit dizzy shot here. Well, as you can see, I actually got all the plants in there. If you kind of see, you can see the roots uh, hanging out over here. And uh, what I'm going to do now is just simply just uh, toss in some more compost on top. I got my bucket here. and We're just going to shake in and uh, go around the circle. And I'm kind of like putting it into the circle in the middle and kind of letting it feather out. Kind of kind of letting it just kind of fall out. And we're just going to go around here until we get this level filled up. So we're just going to go ahead and put this soil on and maybe fill it up halfway to where the next uh, plant set is going to go in. And I think the final plant set we're going to plant in is dandelions. Up to this point we planted pretty much all lettuce and some endive which is related to lettuce. Alright so I got all the levels planted out in the garden tower. Now we got the last level. Now the easiest way to do it is just to get some small six packs and just pop them right in. As you guys can see, I've filled up the soil level so that when I put the plant in, it's right at the right soil level. Then I'll just basically top fill it and the soil will level out and I'll be all set and ready to plant out the top. So well, let's go ahead and continue to uh, plant these guys out. Super simple, super easy, just like this instead of trying to dig holes like many people might. All right, so now that we got all the different plants in place on this top level, next is to fill. Once again, we're just gonna take this and uh, kind of roll it around the center to kind of let it go towards the center and then kind of like, uh, you know, uh, go out by gravity. And we're just going to take our hand and uh, carefully level this off. Man, I think about another uh, bucket full or so, we'll be out to the top level and we'll be ready to plant the top out. All right, got it almost all filled. I think this is the last uh, bucket full we'll need. I like how just to roll this bucket right around it's very simple very easy to fill it up I always encourage you guys to work smarter instead of harder next we got the sonic vibration plate <laughs> all right I think we're about leveled off man now to plant the last few plants up in the top I think I'll plant some spinach for the winter all right so I got all five levels of the garden tower planted out and now we're going to plant out the top. So what I've chosen to do is I'm going to plant one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, little spinach plants on top. Hopefully this will give me a spinach meal in just a couple weeks by letting it all grow out. I like to basically uh, space these guys about equidistant or about the same amount of space from each other and uh, just going to kind of fill it up on the top. 
So that means this planter now has 45 plus 8, so that's like 53 plants, you know, in just four square feet of space. So this is totally amazing. Plus, it pretty much recycles the water, and then actually after I get these guys planted, we'll come back at you and we'll show you guys how this is actually a worm farm to create worm castings and even more worms. All right, so the last step is water well. We got my little uh, rain shower thing here. And we're just gonna go ahead and water this guy. We're gonna water this guy until all the water actually saturates through and starts coming out the bottom. So it may take just a little bit. These guys definitely wanted a drink. Maybe I should, it reminds me of a song I uh, listened to when I was younger. Have a drink on me! Da -da 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 -da. Have a drink on me, plants! Organic plants! That probably wasn't the meaning of the song. <laughs> Alright, so we're watering. And what happens when we water is we're kind of evenly distributing it all the way around. Around and around and around it goes. Where it stops, nobody knows. And what's happening is the water is still trading and uh, sinking down through the different layers, through the different levels of this garden tower. And uh, soon enough, it's going to reach the bottom, and it's going to start coming out the bucket down below. And uh, we'll show you when that happens. Now, it's probably not optimal to like be watering towards the center. We want to try to water towards the outside. This way, the water goes down and gets the roots, the baby roots that are, you know, uh, more closer to the outside than the inside of this garden. But sure enough, the water will capillate basically everywhere and get everywhere it needs to go. Man, so we've been watering for quite a bit of time here. And actually, you know, think about it. What you're really doing is you're filling up literally at like a 55 gallon drum of water. So all the soil will suck up the water like a sponge. So it may take a little bit of time to fill it all up. Hallelujah! <laughs> Man, it took so long for the water to start dripping out the bottom bucket and when I started hearing little drips it was music to my ears because man seriously I've been here for man I don't even know like five minutes straight watering it's insane this thing now is so heavy it's insane so uh, find a place you want it before you water it in because after you water it in you're probably not moving it all right so there you guys see it check it out right there it's dripping out the bottom it'll probably drip for a while because I've probably overfilled it as you guys can see it's like leaching out some of the nutrients from the compost so I'm glad that this is actually going to be able to save the water and dump it back up through the top to uh, water these plants even further to keep the nutrients inside the system. Alright I'm back so check it out I got this baby planted out it's probably been about a week now since I planted this guy out and look at it now it's doing real beautiful some of my plants some of the smaller plants had some transplant shot shock but they're getting over it and everything's just real lush and doing really well in here I mean Particularly the spinach on the top. I don't know when I planted it, you know, there's like little spinach with like like black around the top because like they didn't fill out. But since they've been in there and in the good sun, the spinach on the top has really filled out nicely. In addition, some of these scraggling plants are now putting on a lot of leaves and they're almost ready to be harvested actually. I like that some of the larger plants that I planted uh, did a lot better and they're kind of flourishing than the smaller ones. So I always encourage you guys to start out with some larger size transplants and once again with the larger size transplants you will have to plant them from the back side I like coming up the back side uh, but anyways uh, looks like it's doing well the final stage that I couldn't film earlier because I didn't have the proper things to do it <laughs> is uh, filling up the center tube here and we'll give you guys a close-up on this but the center tube is where the magic happens this is why I like this garden tower system more than any other container garden system I've seen because it literally allows you to keep your own worms and worms will eat your old produce scraps and make fertilizer or the rich worm castings which are really beneficial for your plants so the theory here is if you fill this up with some bedding and some food scraps and you put a bunch of worms in there they're gonna go to town on the food scraps and they're gonna basically go through the holes and the thing to go into the compost all around and you'll have a living system in here that'll create its own fertilizer. That being said, you will also, like I talked about earlier, wanna start with a really good potting soil that's really rich and nutritious. Cause I don't know that I'd leave it to a handful of worms to you know, give nutrients to all over 50 plants here in this tower garden. So the reason why I couldn't complete this project is because I didn't have the worms. 
So I had to figure out where to get the red wiggler worms, which are known as the composting worms or the red worms. Uh, they're oftentimes sold at bait shops and they're used for fishing. Uh, I called a few places around here and they didn't have any actually. So luckily I found a lady on Craigslist who sold uh, the worms for composting and she's kind of like big into keeping her worms, that's her thing. And I'm glad I could support her. And she's selling like uh, 500 worms for $15 or 1,000 worms for 30 bucks. So I went over there and I bought the worms. And actually it's kind of nice, they came in this little uh, like dish uh, tub or dish thing that you would do your dishes in. And this is probably from the dollar store with a top over it with holes in it so that they could breathe and she said you could actually keep the worms in this I mean even if I didn't transport them into something else although she did say that I'd want to take out a bunch of the worms because this area is probably uh, you know too small for 500 worms and maybe I could keep about 200 in there or so and she'd give me directions and everything so that was really cool I mean this is a really fabulous business opportunity for many of you guys entrepreneurs or yet to be entrepreneurs out there you know, start growing some worms, feed your worms, and then, man, just sell 500 for 15 bucks. Get a little dollar store thing and give it to people so that they can have their worms too. The earthworms uh, create some of the best fertilizer on earth for your plants. I mean, think about it. This is how nature works. Why did nature, God, or whomever put the earthworms in the ground to eat up the, and decompose the organic matter and make nutrients for the plants to keep the cycle going? It's all about systems. Anyways, we're going to go ahead and uh, take this top off here. And uh, one of the tips she gave me is when I got these home with the top on it, she said, I want to keep this under a light for like first couple days. And what that'll do is the light is like, uh, you know, that's like, uh, it's like vampires, right? Vampires hate the light. Well, so do the earthworms. The earthworms see the light. They're like, ah, the light. And they don't like blow up or nothing <laughs> or disintegrate. They actually just want to burrow underneath and they go down into the ground because they don't like the light. So this encourages them to stay down in there instead of actually crawling up the sides and then trying to crawl out. So in here it looks like I what I bought was a bunch of shredded newspaper. <laughs> and what it is is a, and I don't know how she counted out 500 worms. Did she sit there and count them? Or did she just weigh them out? I don't know. But basically she shreds up newspaper, maybe some uh, old paper bags in here. And then on the bottom, she basically just put some uh, some standard cardboard as a sheet. And she like, wow, there's a whole bunch underneath there and underneath the cardboard. And this is a nice moisture level. You know, it's not like if I wrung this out, it would barely drip some water. You don't want it too wet, but you don't want it too dry. The earthworms do need uh, uh, the proper moisture level to, uh, to live, actually. And actually, you know, a lot of these newspaper things, I'm not seeing any worms. Maybe that's because they're really deep. But uh, anyways, what we're going to do next is actually we're going to empty out a good number of these earthworms into the center tube so that I could get this uh, garden tower up and running and making some of its own nutrition. All right, so now we're going to fill up our garden tower with the worms. So first we're going to move this uh, PVC cap here that's uh, vented so it has ventilation. Also, you're going to want to keep this cap on so that the, the worms can't see the light because they're going to get scared. And uh, what I'm looking down basically is a tube that goes all the way down to the bottom. And if you remember when I was assembling it, they have that little like uh, plug that's removable actually so you could harvest your worm castings when they're all done. Uh, right now it looks like there's a little bit of overflow of the uh, soil mixture that I've filled this whole container with. And uh, the thing is that this step is completely optional. I highly encourage you guys do this step to keep some live worms in here. If you do not want to do this step, cannot get the worms, you could actually just fill this up with your standard potting mix that you use to fill the rest of the garden. Man, plant something else in there. I could get another plant and leave the top off and uh, have a nice tomato plant. Uh, in any case, we're going to use it to do the worm composting. It's definitely really cool. Now. They recommend that you maybe add just like food scraps like one third of the way up the whole tower and then add like a handful or two of worms in there. I'm going to do a little bit differently. You know, much like we like to have a bed at night and sleep in our beds at night. I mean, I think I'm cool with like sleeping in a sleeping bag in a tent sometimes, but I like my bed, right? It's nice and comfortable like we do. Worms want their bed too and they don't necessarily like to just sleep in rotten food. They like bedding. So worm bedding, like I got here, is actually the uh, 
newspaper shreds so you get a nice shredder and shred some newspaper up and they only use the black and white newspaper and not the colored ones that's glossy um, but instead of the shredded newspaper I'm gonna move my worms on up and give them something a little bit better that they like a lot more well I think a lot more I'd like it a lot more than newspaper shreds and what that is so right here <laughs> we got the coconut core man so that's really cool we got coconut core so we're gonna use some coconut core that's uh gonna be put down the center tube we're just dropping a couple handfuls down we're probably gonna fill it up about that much give them some nice bedding to live in also if you do put in food scraps that's really wet and stuff instead of just kind of rotting in the bottom uh, the coconut core will absorb some of the moisture to like help keep the moisture level balanced out right now the next thing we're going to want to do is of course give the worm some food so while we could give the worm some old food scraps we were dehydrating peppers earlier today so we have a lot of peppers one of the things you will not want to give the worms is like uh, citrus peels it's all right to put citrus peels in your standard compost bin but maybe not the worms uh, while you could do this, and this is what is recommended, I'm going to take it one step further because if you just put food scraps in here, you may get fruit flies and all kinds of other stuff, especially if you don't put some additional bedding like the coconut core on top to kind of insulate and give a layer of the stuff on the inside so that the fruit flies can't land and multiply. I'm going to do something real cool, actually, that I learned in a past video out in uh, Baltimore area in Aberdeen, Veteran Compost. They don't feed their worms food scraps, they feed them finished compost. So we're gonna move it on up. We're gonna give the worms concentrated, <laughs> composted food scraps in the form of the compost that I made here. So uh, let's get some of that out. All right, so here we go. Well, we're spilling. Here's my compost that I made. This is some rich, delicious stuff. Now, you wanna make sure you put in a finished compost to feed your worms, you know, when you smell it, it really shouldn't have a smell. It should just be pretty much a neutral smell. This pretty much doesn't smell like anything. And uh, we're just going to go ahead and uh, fill the tube up. Now, you're going to want to fill the tube about a third of the way full. I mean, this is literally all the stuff you're going to feed your worms. It's like getting feeding your fish, fish food. This is worm food, baby. All right, just topped it off. I think I'm about uh, one third of the way full, maybe a little bit more, probably overdid a little bit but that's all right man this thing's heavy i'm trying to shake it down and get it all even and i'll stick my hand oh no <laughs> all right so we got it all even the next thing is we're going to add the worms so what we're going to do now is we're going to basically just add some of these worms and how we're going to do this is uh probably very carefully without hurting my spinach too much we're just going to take a whole bunch of this bedding stuff and in the bedding uh there's worms or hopefully there's worms and it's just not all bedding and I didn't pay $15 for a box of shredded newspaper. <laughs> all right, so let's see if we could find some of the wormy guys down in here. All right, here we go. There's definitely a few worms in here. I don't know if there's 500. I counted a total of three so far. But all the worms are all throughout here. Oh, here we go. I don't know if you guys could see that in the video. There's some worms in there. They're moving. We want to make sure that we get all the worms down the tube. Isn't that the name for the subway in the UK, the tube? All right, so looks like we're going to take about another handful's worth and put our worms. Oh, man, this, one, this one's an active handful. Check it out. All the worms in there. Now we're going to spread our newspaper back out in here, and we're going to keep these worms on the inside of the house, and I'm not feeding them food scraps. I'm actually going to also feed them the finished compost because they will eat that stuff. So uh, that'll be cool. We'll have a worm bin on the inside and some worms here in the backyard in the tube. Finally, for good measure, I'm just going to take about a handful or two or more core and give them a little bit more bedding material. And uh, we're definitely up past the halfway point now. We might have felt it even too full, but I'm cool with that. You know, I never was one to read the directions. But I'm sure this is going to work just the way it is because we got the worms in there, we got the food in there, they got the bedding, they're going to be totally happy. We just need to ensure that they, it maintains a proper moisture level. So by adding fre the fresh fruit scraps and vegetable scraps that have a moisture content that may keep it the right moisture level. In addition, I have been watering this pretty much every day and using the, uh, the drip off and rewatering it with, with that. It actually does stay fairly well watered, uh, especially when establishing your plants with this system. 
watering it is very important. I've been top watering and for the first couple days I was also side watering each plant and some of the water would kind of overflow in the beginning but now that I'm watering it it seems like the roots are starting to grow and starting to seek out water because that's what the roots do they seek out the water so they don't have to water right at the plant they'll just get the water where it's at. Anyways the last step put the top back on so if you want to learn more about this uh, garden tower you want to check out the website garden tower project Dot com. I think that's pretty much it for my garden tower setup. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video seeing how to set up one of these garden towers. I think this is an amazing setup and definitely important and you should probably buy one if you don't have a large yard to garden in. Maybe even if you have a nice sunroom or patio you could grow this in the winter time when you can't be grown outside. I like that it holds like 50 plus plants in one small you know less than four square feet of space plus also has a worm bin i mean this is doing everything right the main thing you're gonna have to remember is you want to make sure this has as much sun as possible one of the things i'm thinking about is actually putting this on like a piano dolly so i could actually spin it during the day so that i could uh, you know get even light on it so like one side gets more sunlight than the other i'll be able to like keep it on this side one part of the day and then spin it to that side another part of the day or maybe i'll just every other day rotate it so that we'll get some even light, so we'll get some even growage, so that we'll get a lot of food to eat. I mean, easily, once this tower is in production, I'll be able to easily pick a whole salad from it for my meal, and that's great. So if you have a family of four, maybe get four of them. <laughs> and you'll be eating all your leafy greens, no problem at all. Now, the last thing I want to say is when planting, planting this out, I've planted my fall and winter crops in here. If you are planting vining crops or tomatoes or peppers, obviously you're going to want to put you know, some of the taller crops on top, some of the vining crops on the bottom, and plant accordingly because each of the spaces in here are really designed for smaller leafy green style crops or herbs or ones that are going to branch out and vine out and go somewhere else because there's not a lot of space and if you get things too shaded out, they're not going to do well either. So all in all, this is definitely a success with the Garden Tower Project. Definitely recommend you get one if you have, once again, small space, only a patio to work with and want to grow a lot of food for you and your family. I definitely like the Garden Tower Project or the Garden Tower much more than the Tower Garden. They are two different items. The Tower Garden is that hydroponic setup that costs about $500. This actually costs less, allows you to grow more food in a more natural way using organic ingredients. So I definitely would recommend the Garden Tower over the Tower Garden. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. Once again, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time, and remember, keep on growing. All right, this is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. I have another exciting episode for you. I'm yet on another field trip. I'm trying to dodge bullets, man, because I'm in Compton, California.